it's really, how am I going to use this space? I'm going to put things for to use, to live with the way I want to live. It's about, I'm going to arrange this furniture so that when my the people I really, really love talking to are over, that we have a place to sit where it really encourages dialogue and closeness. Welcome to Masters of Trade presented by Diggs. I am your host, Constance Dunn, and today we have an artist and an entrepreneur who for the last 25 years has been innovating real estate and interior design and probably a bunch of other things. Welcome, Ms. Bear Bear. Oh, it's so great to be here, Constance. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting because being on camera is nothing new for you um, because I think it's impressive how you had, I think, a very pretty solid entertainment career before Meredith Bear Home. Tell us about it. Okay. Well, I, I actually start that I was graduating from college mm -hmm. and uh, Jerry Bruckheimer walked up to me, the producer oh. and asked me to be in a Pepsi commercial. And uh, so here I had my journalism degree and uh, that commercial led to a hundred other commercials and some movies that I was in. And, then when I started going up for movies, I went, hmm, I could write better stuff than this stuff. And so I started writing movies. So I did that for 20 years. So I was, I'd been an actress, a model, and then a, um, a screenwriter and a journalist. Uh -huh. And then I accidentally tripped on this new career uh, 25 years ago. And your company, Meredith Bear Home, has just celebrated the 25th anniversary so That's i'm wondering right. yeah yeah when you look back at it does it seem like longer or or less than 25 it feels like two minutes i don't That's know i don't know where those years went honestly right. it feels uh like just zip it went yeah. by well yeah it's it's funny because people know you as the person who innovated and creative home created home staging which is now a staple of real estate um but along the way, you've also, you know, you keep innovating, which I think is interesting. And it makes sense, given that you're a lifelong creative. And I know we, t we have talked before. You've always been very generous to us at Diggs. Um, and Instahome was something that you were talking about. And I find it fascinating sociologically and a bunch of other reasons. But I, I, I know it's a recent offering of your company. And so tell, tell us how it came about and what it's been like so far. We, we started doing it actually probably about 15 years ago, but we didn't, it wasn't until really the pandemic mm -hmm. that we, that it, it just became a huge commodity. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason is the supply chain, uh, people couldn't get furnishings. They couldn't get mm -hmm. what they needed. And we could, if they gave us a week or two in advance, we could manufacture mm -hmm. uh, the exact items they wanted or, or pull them from our inventory mm -hmm. and give them an instant home. So we would, we would get all their specifications, everything they needed, and deliver a home full of furniture in a matter of a day or two, and then give them a price list and they could keep what they want and we'd pick up the rest. And it's and during the during the pandemic, we were just doing it doing them every week. We were doing at least one every week. And all over the country, we would we delivered containers to uh Illinois, Arizona, Washington DC, uh we were doing them in Manhattan and Connecticut, uh in resort areas like Aspen Vale, mm -hmm. Lake Tahoe. And uh, we, it was very, very interesting because uh, the, the whole pandemic, the whole period was uh, so unique to anything I'd experienced in the 25 years. Mm -hmm. And here was people wanted home and they wanted it now because everyone was spending all of their time at home. Mm -hmm. and, and it's interesting and because that, I, I'm sorry. No, uh, go ahead. Yes. Oh, because I've been noticing, you know, I write about luxury real estate. I've been doing it for like a decade and I've been noticing increasingly like in the luxury realm, real estate agents are selling fully furnished homes. And, and I remember yes. you, you and I, you telling me a few years ago, like 
we'll put Q-tips in the house and toothpaste. We've done it and we'll do it. You know? Yeah. Anything they want, we'll do it. I mean, we will completely uh, load up the kitchen. If that's what they want, we'll, we'll get all of their dishes and pots and pans and all that. Anything they need, we'll do. And then yes, also, we also are selling a lot of homes uh, completely furnished. Last week we just sold a hundred million dollar home, uh, and they wanted every single little thing. We didn't pick up anything. They bought every item in the house. Interesting. And, yes, and it was a billionaire's, you know, third house, and uh, and he just that was it. He didn't want to have to lift a finger. Yeah. It's funny, a hundred million. Because at first I was thinking you were saying a million, and then I realized you said a hundred million. Like, how does that happen? <laughs> Why not a hundred million trillion? <laughs> I know, I know. I know. It's a beautiful house in Malibu, you know, right on the ocean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, in the very nicest area. Right. And uh and he he just said, We'll take it. So we, yeah. didn't, we didn't have to pick up the towels even. <laughs> nice. And, and, you know, it goes to something that I think is very impressive at, about your organization, which is like multiple offices, 200,000 square feet in Los Angeles, many artists working for you, is that yeah. you've, you have a very, it's very consistent. I'm, you know, I get your company's newsletter. So I see houses staged by Meredith Bear Home and, Miami and the Hamptons and, you know, you name it. And they're very consistent. So I'm curious about how you've maintained this wonderful consistency throughout a very big organization. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, we, we, there's a group of us in, in my organization that, that do all of the purchasing mm -hmm. and, and designs. So the same furniture goes to our different territories and a, and a certain look. And then the uniqueness really comes in the individual designer or artist. I love the way that you call them the artist because they are. Mm -hmm. um, that That's where the unique look of each property comes in is that is we also, we go to all of the, uh, we go to flea markets. We go to, um, we, uh, we're always going to the auctions and, and everything to find unique items that we also send all over the country, di different mm -hmm. ones. So there, there's certain of our designers that will use more of those. But we, our mm -hmm. basic look comes from our own manufacturing here in Los Angeles and overseas when uh, with our own designs. So I think that's why it's so consistent. And then, but the designers do bring in their own kind of unique look as well. Yeah, no doubt. And I like that you've maintained. And I'm speculating, but I, you know, I see you as this, you know, artist back in the day on the West Side and someone who was eyes always open, thrift shops, plants, what have you. Like you weren't like, oh, it should be from this boutique here. Like there right. was something that I still see in, in your work, which is interesting. And, and I'm curious, tell me about, were you a thrift shop person? Like oh, I'm a treasure hunter. Uh, I, my mom used to drag me around to estate sales growing up and I hated it, you know, but I was exposed to a lot and I just I always, it's just that one thing that when I look at it, it makes me smile. It just looks interesting or it's unique. And, uh, I, I've always been a treasure hunter for sure. Yeah. 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 As so are, bet, yeah. A lot of people in my group are as well. Yeah, and you, and that vibe you still have that, which I think is so great because you obviously work in a luxury, ultra luxury, hyper luxury market, but that right. still exists. Like I could see that you pro you have probably found fifty cent treasures. Absolutely, and we, we want we want our homes to look like the person living there is well traveled and well lived. You know that like mm -hmm. they spent their life going around and in their travels, they picked up a little this year, a little of that there, mm -hmm. just like uh, they put their glasses down to, to, you know, run to answer the phone. And it's, it's home. We, we want to create home. Yeah. And yeah. home isn't, you know, a set of this and a set of that. It's a life. 
It's, yeah. it's people like to surround themselves by things they love that interest them. And our job is to make people walk into that home and just fall in love or yeah. deliver that home to them. And as it requ- yeah. yeah, And it requires not just, you know, good chops as a designer, but a sense of humans and a sense of psychology and intuition. And I'm curious yeah. about that. Like you've, you had a lucky break in entertainment, but to sustain that over many years was required some intelligence and some abilities. And I'm curious, did that impact your, <laughs> yeah, right. And a, a, a lot of grit. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, and I'm curious how much that career impacted your design career. Like for instance, I was looking at one of your CBS segments and you were saying how you, you know, one of your innovations in staging was having like an open cookbook. You have a sense of people, and I'm curious where that came from. Right. Well, um, I, you know, when when as a writer, you're setting the scene. You're just you're, you're you're explaining who the characters are by where they are, where they live, how they live. Mm-hmm. So I always knew how important place is. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think I did know how to set the stage. And it's interesting that it's called staging. It was not my, it was not my invention to call it staging. Brokers started calling it staging and, uh, I just did it, but I knew to set the scene. The idea was, you know, for the kids rooms, you don't have a hundred toys like your own kids have. You have a couple of darling toys that even mom and dad are going to like to look at. And the idea is if the kids are looking at homes with their parents, they're going to pick up that toy and say, mommy, I want this house. So it was, it, it's, it's everything, everything is there for a reason to suggest comfort um, and home. Mm-hmm. You, you want it to look beautiful, but you really want someone to be able to imagine themselves living there in that space. Yeah. And that's what it is. And you've shared with us, like, you had a really interesting upbringing. You grew up in a very kind of distinctive environment. <laughs> yeah, I did. A gated community. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I grew up in St. Quentin Prison. My dad was uh, a, a warden, and we lived on the prison grounds till I was 13. So I don't know if that's how I got my design sense. I, I like stripes, but, uh, uh, but uh, it was... It was very unique, and there were only a small group of kids there, so we had to kind of make things up all the time. We had to make up our own games, our own fun, because there wasn't really that much to do. Um, but uh, uh, I, I think that, you know, once we left there, I, every time my mom would buy a home, I would move the furniture around for her, and she'd say, oh, I like that. But it wasn't like a, a big deal. I would just do it. And she'd say, fine. And so I I think I was allowed to experiment with space as a kid, even. That's wonderful. And it, it, you do that to this day. I mean, do you still do that? Move stuff around? Constantly. I completely redid my home um, about a month ago. (laughs) I I love it. I love it. And it's very powerful. It, it, it is. I mean, I, I like, uh, you know, I'll walk through the living room on my way to the kitchen or something and I'll kind of go, something's not right, you know, and I, I'll start moving things around until, oh yeah, that's it. it and it's something that I think is wonderful because it's not off limits to anyone, you know, which I believe style, you know, I, I think it's, I hate the idea that people think they have to have a lot of money to have a fabulous space that makes them feel good and perform better. Um, I so agree. I so agree. It, it's yeah. it's really just a matter of liking the things that you surround yourself with. Yeah, you know, yeah. That, like if you, you know, I like looking at that painting, and I like you know being near it. It makes me happy. Uh, you know, I I like orchids. I yeah. like you know just whatever makes you happy to to be around. It's all going to work together if you like it all. And you have a knack for this. You could see, you know, your your power of three tip has always stuck with me. And to this, it's been <laughs> something about that is amazing. Like three little things together. Yes, instead of three, not two, 
a set of three or five, mm-hmm. right? It has to be the odd. <laughs> yes. Now, you have a knack for that naturally. And I'm curious for people who are, wish to train their eye to be able to transform their spaces. Any idea on how things that have been helpful to you to training already a very skilled eye? Well, I, I think um, I think that uh, items, especially as we're talking about accessories more, mm-hmm. uh, they ha- they should have a relationship to one another. Either they're um, the same type of things, uh, carved wood statues or mm-hmm. uh, blue vases or whatever it is. Like if, if it's if it's vases, then they should be similar. They should relate to one another somehow and be of different sizes or heights or two are the same size and one is small. And then it's how do they sit next to each other that makes them the cutest? <laughs> so it's just, it's really, it's about things, relationships to other things. And mm. even like in my living room, I like the artwork to relate to each other. I imagine that when I'm sleeping, uh, all the characters in the paintings have all kinds of interesting discussions. And, and that's fascinating because it made me wonder what is interesting to you now? Like what's been exciting and floating your boat? That's a very good question. Um, well, I always love the outdoors as it relates to the indoors. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I'm always pulled to go out in the garden and start moving things around. So whatever I'm and coming back inside and looking at it from the inside out and from the outside in. So I, I love, I've lately really been loving doing that, just going back mm. in and out and in and out and having the outside relate to the inside. Um, in terms of items, I see, I feel really drawn to Asian, uh, old Asian items that have been well loved. Mm. Uh, just, to, I mean, not a whole house full of it, but just, I really like bringing those in to mix with more contemporary pieces where I I just don't like it when things are a set and they're all kind of cookie cutter and it all looks from just one period. Uh, I like, I like modern, I like contemporary a lot, but I don't like it just to be that or it feels cold and unwelcoming to me. So it's, Uh. it's, it's it's what's really floating my boat is just mixing it up. And trying different relationships, and it's it's uh, it, it it is it is all about relationships. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm sorry, that was my friend Spam calling. Oh, I okay. Just, <laughs> there, there's relationships. There you have it. <laughs> but 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 it, you know, I do. I think in life, what I love is home mm-hmm. and relationships, and mm-hmm. I think that design is about relationship. It's about, I'm going to arrange this furniture so that when my the people I really, really love talking to are over, that we have a place to sit where it really encourages dialogue and closeness. And uh, so it's, it's, it's really, how am I going to use this space? I'm going to put things for to use, to live with the way I want to live. You know, so this is fascinating because you're thinking about design and enhancing relationships. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. And even as, I, as I'm as i thinking, I'm actually thinking this through in the moment with you, uh, that even when I'm talking about accessories relating to one another, like in a group, it it also is about relationships. And I think like what when I was writing movies – Movies are about relationships practically always. You know, I mean, that is ultimately what they're about. They're about experiencing people um, and experiencing one another or having experience, new experiences. So I do mm-hmm. think that that furnishing is a lot about relationship and it is there to be used and lived with and, and enjoyed. It's also can be like profoundly personal because I found out, I found for a while, like I'd be very hesitant to invite someone 
to my home. Not that it was, you know, Versailles or anything, but it, I mean, <laughs> when you walk in someone's house, it, it tells you so much about them, right? I so agree, Constance. I, I really do. I, it, it really does tell the story of the person. And uh, that's why, like, I always have people come into my house through the kitchen. I don't know why, why but I, I almost never answer the front door. It's just, it's just, you know, because that's kind of the the hearth. And uh, I know other people do that as well, but I, I guess most people have people come to the front door. But uh, for me, it's come into the kitchen because it's warm and it's it's vital, it's alive. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I've been getting to know this great girl and. Um, it was funny. I was thinking, I think it's time to have her over for dinner, which just seems like this huge <laughs> step. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I was like, why are you being so weird? I'm like, because your home is very like, are you ready to showcase this? Or, or you know, it's just a, an interesting thing. And one of the things that I have always that I admire very much about you as a a woman and an entrepreneur is the fact that you've achieved this very high level of success, yet you've managed, uh, you know, from my impression to maintain those elements that are vital to being an artist. So an openness to new data, you know what I mean? A certain, a, yes. a very unassuming quality. And that doesn't always happen with sustained high levels of success. I think it's really very valuable. Um, and I don't know if you reflect on that consciously, but I'd love it if you could share some ways, perhaps. That's, that's really interesting. I've been thinking about it a lot. I just recently turned 75. And, and I, um, I'm very proud that I started my business when I was 50. And uh, um, I find that as I sometimes I don't can't even relate to being successful because I love just what I do so much and the people I work with so much that uh, that moment and is really all that matters. I have to say that yeah, I'm a lot. I have a lot more money than I ever had, and all of that. I I'm so surprised that that doesn't mean that much to me. At this point in my life, uh, I don't have any desire to have a bigger, fancier house than I bought or built 20 years ago. Um, and I think ultimately, ultimately what matters to me are, are friends, people, um, and experiences. And, uh, I mean, I guess the, you know, one of the things I love the most is making spaces beautiful. It just makes me very happy. So I, I feel kind of very satisfied that I get to spend my time or have been spending my time the last 25 years doing what I really love, not what I was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, I, I find that I really like simple. I like, life to be simple. I don't really like fancy. I like, uh, I like comfort. You know, I like friends. I mean, I mean, the things that really matter and family, the things that really matter at the end of the day are those things. Yeah. Yeah. Peace. In other words. Oh, you bet. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. the, the ultimate luxury. <laughs> It's really nice not to have to worry about paying the bills. I mean, I it's much nicer to not have to worry about that than to worry about it. Um, yeah. But also, I found I've also found that trying to I feel like life has given me a lot, and I feel that uh, I have a strong desire to take what I have and try to help people who need it and inspire, mm -hmm. particularly young women um, and people in need. Uh, with our, our group, uh, has been really developing a very large, uh, philanthropy division oh. where we help Habitat for Humanity, um, and all kinds of, you know, Girls Inc., all kinds of organizations in any way we can with furnishings and, uh, you know, kind of anything they need that we do that can help them. And yeah. 
my designers raise their hand. They want to go work and do this for free. Yeah. And we want to give it uh, to the people who need it where, where it's a good fit. But it's, it's interesting that at the end of the day, those things are what matter to me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and along with this idea of lifting, you know, a rising tide, lifting all boats is that you employ yeah. lots of artists. And I always love, I, oh, yeah. I got to, I got to Willy Wonka it through your your headquarters a few years ago, and I yes. thought it was so cool to see this artist in your one division, and it's an yes. artist, and yeah, you're we employing have actual, we have actual paint uh, artists sitting there painting mm-hmm. uh, huge canvases that are going to go into a house the next day. Yeah. I mean, it's, that, it's that kind of raw and wonderful. Whenever, yeah, it, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, seeing them and also. Down to it, like our crews are. I have so many people that have worked with that I've worked with now for twenty years. Yeah, and they these are you can't believe how much work goes into what we do. Just the physical work, and these guys always have a huge smile on their face. They're lifting stuff. They're smiling. They're joking. I mean, I'm sure they don't have every day like that, but they're they're just fantastic people, and it's. Uh, it's great to see the way they all work together from the from the young woman who's there painting, you know, in the warehouse uh, to, uh, you know, to the to my to all the other people that are working in the office. It's just mm-hmm. an amazing group. Yeah. And you've gotten accolades for that. I mean, I know your organization, you've gotten like more than a you know, more than a few accolades for like being like best of employers and. Um, yeah. It, oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I'm. I. I would say that's one of the things I'm also most proud of. But I'm. I'm yeah. really proud of my people and 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 how they work together and what they do and that it all just works. Yeah. And it it it, it makes sense that you're really thinking about this investment of other people because. Yeah. I think that's my next chapter. Is that right? Yeah. Well, I'm still figuring it out, but I, I'm sorry, I'm hanging up on them. (laughs) Oh, it's okay. (laughs) They're all calling. They're all calling. Um, Because I imagine, and I think we live in interesting times where it's more confessional, right? And, you know, I came up or my background is such that, you really didn't spill a lot about trials and tribulations, right? right. And, and now it's becoming more so, like, more acceptable and – or not accept people just do it more. And, and I think for you, especially with a background in entertainment, you know, you like, again, you got that, like, amazing break, which I think is awesome, but you came up from – you didn't have, you know, a, an uncle in the business. Um, right. You – you had all the ingredients within yourself to again sustain the success to then move yeah. into this arena and not just like do a few homes and charge a couple hundred bucks but you know consciously evolve this and i think that it would be great to hear like some of the stories because it wasn't all you know lollipops and sunshine no doubt as a matter of fact, you know, uh, the good news and the bad news is that no one lent me money along the i mean i couldn't get a loan i didn't know how to say the right things on the application to get money whereas i know people who can just uh, you know come in write something and they want to give it, give us money um so i had to build the company basically incrementally with the profits that we made. So I built this huge company where we're doing over $40 million of business a year uh, from without debt, without debt. And um, I feel, I feel very proud of that, but I, I'm also kind of like, how did I do that? How did we do that? How, how, did, we, how did we get here? Um, uh, it, it, it's interesting, but you know, I think first of all, as a woman, it, it's, it, especially 25 years ago, it, you just, you couldn't get someone to back you. You couldn't get anyone to back you. So uh, we just, you know, we'd get the check for the job tomorrow and we'd run out and we'd scramble and we'd find what we needed. And, uh, uh, you know, all kinds of things happened along the way, the good, the bad and the ugly. 
And um, we just got through it. We just worked our tails off and we got through it. Yeah. Did you think about it? Like when there were times where you felt like very overwhelmed or close to overwhelmed, did you keep something in mind? Like, was there something that you always kept as a, a very helpful totem mentally Not that you'd like really. to share? It was, it was more that I, I really felt like I had no choice but to get through it. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, I remember the State Board of Equalization at some point said we should have been charging um, tax on on the staging. And we, you know, I think maybe we were three years old at that point or something like that. And so they, so they said, so you have to go back with every job you've ever done and pay us the tax. <laughs> and they froze my bank account. You know, and it was kind of like, ah! you know, and I don't know how we got through it. Somehow, <laughs> somehow we got through it. I think I didn't have money to pay anyone for a week, you know, until I figured out, you know, what to do. But there, there are those kinds of things where you, you it just, all I knew is that I had to get through it and I was going to get through it. And I didn't have a choice. I had a lot of people depending on me and I was going to get through it. Yeah. And I, uh, I, I didn't ever really have uh, that kind of a totem. I, th- I think I, it was always very important to find the good people, people that I genuinely like and respected to work with. Yeah. And uh, I, that always meant a lot to me. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I'd, I'd come across someone really, really talented that it just wasn't a fit. Right, right. And I'd, I'd have to choose the fit first, it, which is painful for someone who really values the talent. And, and I'm curious about that. I, you know, I know it's the experience that's very common, and sometimes perhaps it's more common with women that – you go, man, I knew that was going to happen. I had it in my gut, but I went against it. And, you know, lo and behold, you know, yeah. it became a the whole, whole, you know, chowder fest all over the place. Yes, and, yes. And, and it, if you wish to share, if there was a time when you finally said, that's it, intuition, that's, yeah. it's an absolute. Yes, yeah. You have, you, have to, you have to trust your gut. There's no question yeah. about it. Uh, yeah. When you don't, you know, you pay the piper. It's true. And someone very smart was telling me intuition isn't necessarily this like, ooh kind of, you know, metaphysical. It's actually integrated knowledge. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. It's, just, so. it's, it's something that you just know in your gut. Um, that's true. You know, mm-hmm. you, you know, and um, you can try and talk yourself out of it for different reasons. But you do. Mm-hmm. We, I think we all know that we all know a lot of stuff that we don't know how we know it. We just know it. Yeah. And, and I'm it's, curious. And it's not, it's not some airy fairy kind of a thing at all. It's just, right. it's, as you're saying. Now, do you have some, like a piece of advice that you wish to share that could be relevant to any, you know, new entrepreneur, female entrepreneur um, that you think is, is really been on your mind or you think that is important? I think one of the things that, uh, uh, I learned 25 years ago was you say yes, and then you figure out how to do it. Nice. But nice. Uh, I, I think the, the, the best thing I ever did was just to say yes to anything <laughs> anyone asked me to do in the early days in terms of staging. Can you do, can you do this uh, 15,000 square foot house? Yes. Yes. Yeah. You know? yeah. And then, okay, 15,000 square foot. Okay. But then you just do it. Yeah. And, and to, and then to, you know, it's, it's a matter of really seizing opportunities that are there as opposed to needing to be hit over the head with it. Right. Is that you have to just sort of kind of say yes to things as they come up. And not every yes is going to lead to something you want to do or to something great. But I think to, to say, yeah, I can do this and go down the road and do the work. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, I think what a lot of people forget about entrepreneurs is that it's to be successful. I mean, to get anywhere in life, you have to show up 
and you have to do the work and and really really give it a chance to work give it a chance mm-hmm. now have you had to be and this could be entertainment or you know have you had to be bolder than is comfortable for you and if so like how have you managed to like make that grittiness that maybe wasn't native to your personality happen again i think i think that the way i made it was that i had to survive and i had it i had a, i things had i had to make them work hmm. and so i would just do it i mean even like um being on the show I'd have to kind of go, oh, my God, I, people are going to see how old I am and but, you know, whatever. But I, the thing is, okay, you know what? I'm just going to do it. And I'm going to be me, right? And, and I, I think, cur- call it courage, whatever, is you just get up, put your big girl pants on, and you do it. Yeah. <laughs> now, how can someone cultivate that? Or perhaps there's no way to exercise that at the gym. Perhaps that's just life. I mean, I, I think to pay, I think, I think the big advice I would have is to really pay attention to what interests you. Um, to really, really pay attention to what genuinely interests you because if you have to, if you want to be successful, you're going to have to sustain that interest. So if it is interesting to you and truly interesting, then keep following the trail of that interest right and it would probably lead you to what you'd be the most successful with ah okay and you know back in the day when you're like 13 adolescent or a teenager when we start thinking about things like careers beyond my dream of being a a a champion roller skating (laughs) (laughs) but you know the the funny things so as a kid, you're like, I'm going to do this. I was like, I used to see these ads for executive secretary on TV and I'd be like, oh, that looks so fabulous. I'd love to be an executive. <laughs> um, but thinking back to like an adolescent or teenage Meredith Bear, what would she think of Meredith Bear now? Like, would she be thinking, oh, that's she'd hilarious. Scratching, she'd be scratching her head. She'd go, what? <laughs> because I think, I, as I recall, like I, I re- the only thing I ever really thought I would be is a writer. And it's interesting because, you know, I went to a one room schoolhouse at San Quentin Prison, and I had the same kids in my class for you know every year, and I was usually the only kid in my grade. Now I was the warden's daughter, so I got straight A's. But then when I moved to a regular high school in Des Moines, Iowa. They had something called a tracking system. It was one, two, three, four, five, which really meant um, dumb, uh, average, smart, and talented, right? And they put me in the dumb kids class, and I did poorly. And then one day, my teacher was sick, and a, and a substitute came in, and he asked us to write something, and I wrote something, and he read it, and he said, would you read this to the class? And I said, Sure, you know, I read it to the class. And the next day, he had me transferred to the talented group. And I became a straight-A student. Now, all this taught me was that I was bored in the dumb kids class. And um, I, when, when this gentleman uh, said I was a good writer, I thought about myself differently. Mm-hmm. And applied myself differently, and was interested. So, uh, so then I, I mean, even though I would move my furniture around for my mom, it was never like, oh, that is fabulous. You could be a X Y Z, a designer. That wasn't like my family didn't think that way. They thought about careers, you know, and uh, that wasn't something my family ever saw themselves doing, you know, but I, or it just, it just didn't come up, but a writer. Yeah. That would be, that would be something I could feel good about. Right. And, and I enjoyed it. And, uh, 
Yeah. So, so that self would have looked at who I became and just scratched her head and went, what? <laughs> or, it's, or it's like, ultimately, you're an artist, which you were back then as well, a creative. Um, right, right. Yeah. So, and yes. it's taken all these different platforms and, and, sure. and, and sure. we get to appreciate them. I get to appreciate them every time I look at some of your works and I get ideas. Thank you. And, Thank yeah. you. <laughs> but, but I mean, all in all, the same kid who was underperforming in the dumb kids class is the same person who did well in the talented kids class. And I think we all are that. We're all capable of underperforming and overperforming. Or it's just really that right fit. You know, that I fit agree. where it feels like, I love this. Yeah. And being good in one thing or superlative in one thing doesn't then mean that you have to be this heroic figure who's wonderful in everything, perhaps. No, no. Yeah. Uh, absolutely not. Um, yeah. You know, I don't, uh, I'm often not the smartest person in the room, you know, and I'm often, you know, don't know a lot of stuff other people don't know. But boy, can I move their furniture around. Darn tootin'. Well, we thank you so much. <laughs> we always, I know you you do a lot of media and you, uh, you know, have a lot of people vying for your time. And again, we appreciate that you've always been so generous to us here at Diggs TV. Thank you. I love you guys. And it's such a pleasure to, to see you and to, to in person. Yes. Yes. I really I'm enjoyed a, this. Yes. You're definitely a entrepreneurial uh, Shiro, hero, a <laughs> Shiro. <laughs> and by the way, I love that you're, you play such an emphasis on peace because it's, it shows like you're very, very lovely to look at. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.